Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 125. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Steve Cockrum. Steve is an inspirational communicator, serial entrepreneur, author, and confidant to elite leaders around the world. He is highly skilled at make, making people think, laugh, and act. Steve is a co-founder of Giant Worldwide and Giant London. He has co-authored multiple leadership books, including his most recent, The Communication Code, which details how to set the parameters of a conversation from the outset, preventing misunderstandings and miscommunication, and highlights recognizing the power dynamics of interactions to help. Steve, I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Natalie, thank you. Uh, I always dread listening to my introductions, thinking, gosh, who are they expecting to arrive? But that was very kind of you. Thank you. Honored to be with you. Oh, my pleasure. Actually, the truth is, one of the reasons I run the, I, I, I have a podcast selfishly is because I get to learn from my guests and Everything that I mentioned in the bio is areas where I could always use a little touch up myself. So I'm definitely excited to dive into it. And one of the things I like to ask my guests at the beginning to set the stage for our conversation is the backstory. You know, how did you get to where you are? I don't think most, you go into a regular kindergarten, um, primary school, you ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. Very few of them say leadership consultant. So the question became, how did you get here? What is your process? And why specifically or how specifically did you get into the people management, the soft skills, all that, will, which we will talk about? How specifically yeah. did you land in this area? Uh, the, the overarching answer would be through trial and error and getting it wrong, Natalie. But um, I'm a mutt in the sense of going, nobody would ever have a similar resume background to me. I've been um, a school teacher a pastor, mm. a nightclub owner, um, a consultant in nonprofit world, a consultant in the commercial world, and effectively latterly more an author, speaker, and um, SaaS entrepreneur. So you can take your pick of any of those, but all of them really shapes who you are, as you say, but nobody would ever look at it at the time and think these strands would actually become incredibly useful and valuable in the thing that I do now. So yeah, that's my background. I've, I've been married for 31 years. That's probably the single greatest achievement I have. And I'm very grateful to Helen for that. And we have three girls and uh, who are 23, 19 and 12. I must be wow. getting old. Um, and yeah. yeah. And, and live in London. So there you go. I okay. hope that gives a little bit of context to who you're talking it to. It certainly does. But I, I will tell you those first three, I think it was first three that you listed there. I think you said educator, pastor and nightclub owner. So that is interesting. I'm a, I'm a former educator. Um, I do have rabbinic yes. ordination. I, was, I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't even a, a congregational rabbi, but I do have, like I said, ordination and certainly yes. had that title in a lot of my professional work. Never went the nightclub route. So just curious to know, how did you, <laughs> how did you number one, kind of meander or what, make your way through those different areas? And how did that ultimately bring you to where you are now? So in a sense, the nightclub was tied to um, the church that I was one of the younger pastors of, and that we opened a bar nightclub in central Manchester that had a 1200 capacity on four floors. Um, we broke every rule I've come to know about how startups should function. We raised uh, close to a million pounds from 126 families in the church who had a heart largely for their grandchildren and children that were in nightclubs, um, still believe in the model in the sense we became part of the fabric and scene and we've you know we won awards from the police and the drugs agencies but we never managed to find a business model which actually worked i think if you're not um laundering money or selling drugs it's really hard to make the nightclub industry work from my mm. experience so mm -hmm. that was the low point um mm -hmm. i went from concept fundraise opening administration chapter 11 um, and then final closing all in the space of three years. And uh, mm. I said I did the most expensive MBA ever. I think it cost wow. in the end about two million pounds um, of other people's money. And I think that was wow. the the moment 
when somebody said to me, Steve, we're going to pay for you to go away and study two things in Oxford. And they were both about personality. And I'd never heard of any of them. One was called Myers-Briggs. The other was called Fire OB. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I've got nothing much on at the moment. Um, and they said, it's not for you, Steve. It's primarily for your wife. Mm -hmm. And I went, I was 33 years old, and uh, it was jaw dropping in the sense of how predictable human behavior was, and how unemotionally intelligent I'd probably been for the previous 33 years. So the next 20 mm -hmm. years, Natalie, have been, you know, it is if you'd ask any of my friends at age 30, who would be an international guru on relational intelligence, uh, mm -hmm. my name would not have been in the top 100 of their 100 friends. So mm -hmm. in a sense, I think um, I think Henry Newman wrote the book, The Wounded Healer. And he said mm -hmm. that basically the place we often have the greatest empathy for other people's struggles and challenges of when we ourselves have been through it. So mm -hmm. in a sense, the journey towards helping others make different mistakes from the ones we'd already made and the codification of those in simple visual tools that educated children could understand because we wanted, in many ways, for Jeremy and I as sort of business partners, we wanted the things we'd learned mm -hmm. to not just to shape the academic world, but to actually for ordinary people in their everyday lives, trying to make relationships work in their homes, their families, their teams, to have some tools that would enable them to be far more effective at doing relationships. Because mm -hmm. most people's pain comes because they're unable to make relationships work even when they try hard and that causes a lot of fracture a lot of dislocation a lot of pain and um, ultimately impacts society at a pretty profound level yeah i mean i do want to talk more about relationships in a moment it is interesting you talked it to use my terminology the school the school of hard knocks you know the mm -hmm. the fact that that oftentimes life is is really the greatest teacher um, yeah. My first book, which is Becoming the New Boss, was written really as a reflection in many ways. It's not a memoir, but it's a reflection yeah. of my experiences as a head of school, as a new head of school, and the challenges that I encountered in that process. Not everything was terrible. There was a lot of really good that happened as well, but I definitely made a lot of mistakes. And I use that to write about it in the book and, and my work as a, as a leadership coach as well, a performance coach, to help people to avoid many of the landmines that I encountered personally in the process of trying to do a good job and help other people and things like that. And so, you know, oftentimes, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned to you before we, we started recording is that I end, end the segment with something you already dove into, which is a mistake, right? I always talk about the reason we, we talk about mistakes on this podcast, the reason that I emphasize the fact that mistakes are par for the course for really everybody is because oftentimes we look up to certain individuals and they say they're they're ready made they're perfect they were they were they were born for this and that that misconception i think is very very damaging because it creates this perception of i don't have those tools i wasn't gifted with that ability or with that knowledge you know intuition etc so i'll never be able to become that whatever the that may be and while there is truth to it to a degree i mean we all have our own abilities and our own limitations but we oftentimes impose much greater limitations on ourselves than we should because we think we're not able to overcome and then we have conversations like you and i are having right now and we're unpacking right away hey i made this mistake and i chapter 11 <laughs> over here and social social you know, emotional intelligence bomb over there and and yet here you are and you're influencing people and you're making a difference yeah, yeah. and so so that's that's the kind of thing i like to like to really unpack so let's dive into the so the soft skills um you talked about communication yeah. as a big one relationships i'll, I'll give you the option yeah. of, of diving in a little bit more why do you think that people struggle so much from a lead, let's focus mainly from the perspective of a leader, though it could certainly work in a, you know, spousal relationship or anywhere else. Why is it so hard for people? Yeah. And how do you help them to find a better way? So I think the first thing that we say in the book, which is quite a striking claim, is that maintaining healthy long term relationships is the exception, not the norm. And that applies in the world of work as much as it does in the home 
and initially you think how can that be true surely it should get better over time our experience is it doesn't and making any long-term business relationship work really takes a huge amount of effort and at the center of just about every relationship is actually the health is dependent upon the health of the communication that exists between those relationships so we'll say is this is transmitting information is not the same as healthy communication and every transmission of information carries with it an expectation that demands understanding of the code that lies behind it so when we began to look at it in detail we realized it's no wonder communication doesn't work most of the time but fundamentally because when i share words with you i don't necessarily give you the clues as to what expectations come with it of how i'd like you to respond to me and so therefore you will almost always respond in what we call your default communication codes now, if you and I are wired the same way, which we may well be from the things we've done in our lives, we will actually not notice a glitch in the communication. You'll finish my sentences. We'll kind of, we'll collaborate together when we're being harsh and critical. No one will notice. But that's because we happen to have a similar nature in the way we engage with the world. But about 90% of the time, the people we deal with are different to us. And so therefore what happens is as I respond to your transmission, I'm either going to miss you or I'm going to collide with you most of the time. So fundamentally, healthy communication that happens by accident only happens in a very, very small number of relationships where the person you're talking to is wired like you. So you'd be amazed how many CEOs try desperately to hire diversity in wiring and personality and gifting and almost always end up with a disproportionate amount of people who are wired like they are. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, they connect with them, they communicate with them easily, and therefore it feels far more at home, far more familiar, and a lot less confrontational. But of course, you end up often with group think and the same yeah. perspective. So that's the reason why Nathalie is, is going to communication that works well, actually is accidental and very, very fortunate. Most of the time it doesn't work. That's interesting. But I want to I want to push back on that last sentence only because I yeah. think there's more there to unpack. Please. And that is it could be accidental, but it could also be intentional. In other words, yes, you could get lucky, so to speak, and find the right people and communicate with them and all of that. But maybe you could unpack this for us, Steve, a little bit more. If I know that I'm surrounded with people who are not on my mm -hmm let's say wavelength yeah. or frequency. Yeah. I think it's a great yeah. metaphor, by the way, because if in fact, you know, like my kids got walkie talkies and whatnot. So when they're not on the right, when the right frequency, you could tell, right? The message doesn't come yes. through or it comes through at a yeah. high pitch or whatever the issues are with, with, yeah. with regular interaction, you don't have those warning signs. It doesn't come, it doesn't come across that way. So you need additional intuition. Yes. You also need additional intention in your communication. So what 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 are some of the things you coach leaders to do when they're talking inevitably and invariably and consistently with people who aren't of the same mindset as themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the first thing you have to acknowledge that transmission is not the same as communication. A lot of leaders share information in email or company video or even talking to their group and assume because they've transmitted words, communication has happened. Once you understand that that's not necessarily true, you're halfway there. Then the question we found is, and you highlighted it before, is we can become a lot more intentional in how we communicate by sending the code of how to interpret our transmission ahead of the information. And that, that's really what the communication codes are. So, you know, I'll give you the cliff note version, but there's it's, it's almost like going, if I can tell you how I'd like you to respond to the transmission so you have clues, then you can choose to relate and connect and we have a much better chance. So the first code is critique. I may say to you, Natalie, look, this is about to go live today. Um, please, where's the mistakes in it? Do the due diligence, ask the difficult questions. It's going to be really costly to pull this release back 
if something's wrong. So you won't hurt my feelings. I'm really inviting you to fully critique this because we're ready to go. Collaboration is number two. So to collaborate, if I said, Natalie, um, I, I want us to collaborate on this. Um, I think I've got something that's really good so far, but I want you to add your knowledge, skills and expertise because I believe that together we can come up with something that's better than what I can come up with on my own. So full collaboration invited to you. The third one is clarify, where I might say to you, um, I'm going to share something with you, you know, Naftali, but what comes out first probably isn't going to be my fully thought through considered view. Will you ask a few good questions, pull on what I'm saying until actually um, I've, I've really got out what I'm trying to say. And then we can maybe go into collaboration or even critique. But please clarify first. The, the fourth one is care. And care says this, I might say this to you, look, I just need a safe place with the relationship I trust. Um, I'm so frustrated or I'm worn out and I'm, I'm going to share my frustrations with certain individuals or certain commercial situations that have happened. I need a safe place that for me, I can let off a few frustration grenades. I, I can probably swear a little. I can say things that are inappropriate. I don't mean it. I don't want you to judge me on what I say. And I don't need you to solve me. I just need you to listen and be a kind of a, a confidant friend and to care is the way we do that. And then the last one is celebrate, where I may say, hey, Natalie, we, this is amazing. I know we're not very really good at this, but this is really important to me. When we won that big deal, um, we've been working out for six months. It's going to make a big difference to the company. We're going to go out for, you know, drinks at lunchtime. And I want us to spend at least half an hour with the team celebrating that this was a big moment, not your usual deal of a couple of minutes and then move on to how we make it better. So those five codes of critique, collaborate, clarify, care, and celebrate may sound like quite simple, but the difference when I'm about to say, hey, Natalie, before I share this with you, I'm inviting you, can you clarify first? And then I'm gonna invite you to collaborate with me. What happens then is you understand the expectation which comes with the transmission of information. Now in team meetings, this is huge because we put this vocabulary and language into some of the biggest companies in the world. And they all say the same thing is, it means we hear each other. And occasionally I will still get it wrong. My default communication code, my accidental me is collaborate and critique. <laughs> but the difference is now, Jeremy will say to me sometimes, my business partner says, hey Steve, um, this feels more like critique than collaborate. Can you kind of tone it down a little? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Or he'll say, hey, right now, I just, I don't need you to solve me, Steve. I don't need you to be the consultant. I just need a safe place to talk out loud and get the poison out because otherwise I'm going to kill somebody. So that's the heart that lies behind it, which basically means you can now communicate more effectively with anybody because you've got much more chance the way you respond will match the unspoken expectations because that person has given you a code to interpret the transmission of information. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> okay. I did take some notes on that one because there was quite a bit there. I um, thought you, you might. Know, the, Sorry. The, the, the former educator, it, well, I, I still do educational coaching, so I'm still in that space. And yeah. um, I, I heard a few different things. Number one, I often tell teachers that their, their professional title is, is misleading because the word teach does imply to many the dissemination of information, of content. I said, your goal is to be a facilitator of learning. And the difference yeah. is that you haven't taught effectively unless learning has occurred. And you, right. you, 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 you hit on that because you talked about the fact that I might communicate and maybe I've got this seemingly great way for, uh, of which I'm going to do it, memo, video, et cetera. But the learning is ultimately, or the, the intake is ultimately the goal. And so yeah. leaders need to be mindful of the fact that just because I put it out there for the world to hear doesn't necessarily mean people got it, people yeah. internalized it. In fact, interestingly enough, when I used to do classroom walkthroughs, which would be observations, mm -hmm. and then I do a write-up, I would send it to the teacher and oftentimes got no response. 
Then mm-hmm. what I started to do is invite them in before I did the write up and say, explain to me this, help me understand that. Let's talk about this. And then I would write it up afterwards. And that was much more of a collaborative process. So mm-hmm. that was a way by which to take what I wanted mm-hmm. them to, to internalize, but rather make it more about them than about me. And then they owned it. Another thing you talked about in my language, again, translating is demystification. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. you know, when, when, when as a student, I don't, you know, a teacher needs to demystify the learning process, the expectations, if the student's going to get the very much, the very best out of the class. And in your case, what you were describing, I think, is when you tell people as the leader, this is what I want out of you in response to what I share with you. Number Mm -hmm. one, you're giving them a pathway forward. They have a better sense of how to respond. But number two, they're internalizing it from the beginning knowing what you're asking them to produce in response. So that actually makes the communication much more effective because it's much more targeted. If I, if I, you know, I used to, when I went to, when I, when I pursued a doctorate, um, I had two types of professors. One would say, here's a a 40, 80 page article, read it and, 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 and share your thoughts. The other one was, here's the same length article. Here are two or three questions to respond to. And I always found the second version much easier to work with because I had, a focus. I, I wasn't just open-ended. And so we got yeah. as leaders, we have to communicate. And the last one you talked about, which I think is great, at least with you and Steve, uh, you and um, Jeremy, Jeremy, I think is your partner. Yeah. yeah. With you and your yeah. partner is that um, you guys have a language that you've created that you want, that you can just sort of drop even a couple yeah. of words and he's, and he gets where you are and vice versa. And that's a special. I mean, that's that you're at a special place. I think at that point that you've really honed in your communication, where you're able to really make that point clear. So this is great. You know, I think if you, you if people walk through this, of course, they should grab a copy of your book and 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 really unpack it in greater detail. But that that's a great framework. I think the thing is, we, we try to design everything for educated teenagers. So we Mm -hmm. had a principle, which was if an educated 13 year old couldn't understand it, use it and teach it to their friends. It was too complicated for leaders in the digital world, because it doesn't matter how good the learning moment is in the classroom or the online workshop. If you we we said if it isn't visual, interactive with a media application, it just gets blown away in this tsunami of tasks, emails, calls and everything else. So it's i always say to people is it takes a lot of time to make the complex simple without making it simplistic and and that's the bit where people look at it and go five c's how on the earth can that be i could use that tomorrow and i go you can and just that i think to your point just being aware that transmission is not the same as communication but the other thing is i don't have to give you a book to be better at listening to you so i may say hey Natalie, hey before i respond what are you hoping happens here are you just wanting me to you know be a good friend and listen and be with you are you, you are you asking me to kind of ask good questions or are you really asking me to kind of help make this better G- give me some sense of what your hope is from how you'd like me to respond so i haven't taught you the communication codes at this point but what i have done is i've demonstrated an empathetic ability <laughs> to actually be able to say, hey, before I launch into what I think you might want me to do, I'm going to check because nobody feels when somebody hears you, understands you and takes the time to really value the contribution you're trying to bring, everything changes. You asked earlier, you know, what was your biggest failure? And I nearly told you, well, I told you one. The one I would have said actually was in the beginning, I thought silence in the team meeting was agreement through my early career i thought if people were i'd ask people their opinions and silence i thought was agreement and it turns out it wasn't it turns out that basically people were afraid of my critique and in the way i'm wired that is carried as a what we call a grenade launcher so when i turn around and say has anyone got a better idea than my genius strategy i've just shared with you i'm really not looking looking for anything other than celebration (laughs) Mm -hmm. i wasn't really looking for them to critique or collaborate because i thought i had all the answers and once you've blown up somebody for challenging nobody else wants to play and so that was uh, so a lot of leaders i say particularly the highly driven highly strategic forceful personalities 
one of the things with communication is you have to create the environment where people feel safe enough to challenge but they'll always do it if you give them the invitation to collaboration or even the invitation to critique with a clear definition of what that means and a commitment on your part that it's what you're actually asking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I do like that piece also, because oftentimes you talked about earlier in this last little uh, segment about listening and asking the question, what is my role? You know, and, and, and sometimes we all, we all think it, and we think about it all the time because the roles change. Even if I have a title, it doesn't mean that the role is the same, but yeah. it varies by the individual I'm talking with, the circumstances, et cetera, and clarifying what the individual who's speaking with you yeah. and is typically asking something of you really wants from you is mm -hmm. important too, especially if you don't have the language yet and you're just trying to figure it out. And I would say, even for those of for those folks who are listening, who may not sit at the very top of the perch, but they have leadership responsibilities, but they report up as well. Leading mm -hmm. up is a critical piece, right? So we we want to make sure that we can serve other people, and sometimes they need to tell us what that looks like, and they don't. And so we need to ask them, "What is it that I can do here that would be most helpful to you?" And when you put Absolutely. it that way. Not only will you get the best response, but the the leader will say, wow, this person really listens to me. This person really values me, which only builds the relationship and the communication more. Your listening skills are outstanding, Natalie. Uh, it's, it's almost like you're a pro at this. I, I, yeah. I think one of the things we do in organizations is to go, if you, if you want to build a healthy culture, culture is like quite an amorphous word, but everyone knows it's important. What we always say to people is if you ask the the anthropologists, mm -hmm. they'll always tell you that basically um, culture is created through common vocabulary or words that come to mean the same thing at the same time at the same place with the same people. Mm. And we took it a stage further to go, OK, that's good. But if we're in a visual uh, world now, people remember what they see, not what they read. If we can create uh, visual tools, communication code being an example of one of them that creates an objective common language, it takes away a lot of the conflict that often happens when I go, hey, you're not doing X or Y. And when a whole team or a whole organization or a whole company, and this is the advantage of technology and platforms and the things which create scale, you begin to create a common vocabulary for how you do people, how you do teams, and how you'll find if you go to, you know, we got about a thousand independent consultants around the world who work with us. So I don't know how many clients that would represent now, but you'll go in. It's almost like people have joined a cult because they all you, you'll hear them using the vocabulary of five voices, the vocabulary of communication code gears, all the things we've created over the years to do exactly what you just described, which is to go, can we create healthier communication and collaboration the way you do that? is when you can use short form vocabulary or language that everyone understands what it means. And actually when people come in, they go, oh, you have a you have a language for how you do people and relational intelligence. And it's really powerful. They have it for other things. You know, if you, you go into kind of IT services, Scrum, you know, and the way Scrum masters work, the vocabulary is the same. Every profession has a vocabulary. The question is, can we create a vocabulary language which works across the spheres of culture that means you can do people and relationships better everywhere? That's our intent. That was our hope um, in what it is we've been doing. Wonderful. And I, th I think it's it's as needed now as ever. Um, you know, the more digitized we become, the more human we need to re-become, re so to speak, and, and, and re-invoke. Right. And I think people, despite all the tools we have at our disposal, are still hungry for that connection. So this is really great. And I really hope True. that people will check out your system in greater detail and all of that. And we're going to, we're going to talk you. soon about how they could reach out to you. But in the meantime, I am going to pivot to the rapid fire where Come the on. answers are short. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. I look yeah. forward to this. Come on. Oh uh, yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. The best or worst advice you were ever given. And you could answer one of each if you wish. Gosh. Um, the worst advice I was ever given was to, almost like treat people like you would want to be treated yourself. And that is, you get it wrong about 80% of the time. I know the mm. intent was good in it. 
<laughs> but actually the application of it was very limited. So two things that was almost like okay. the golden rule, the platinum rule. Yeah. Platinum rule was do unto others as they would want done for them. That's the difference. Mm. Keep going. Sorry. Uh, I'll be more rapid. I got it. Oh, uh, no, all good. All good. Two things everyone should, every leader should do more often. Um, take time out to recharge their physical, emotional, intellectual batteries. If mm -hmm. you don't have a first gear strategy, you'll in the end become less effective in relationships and performance. And the second one is to remember that when you die, nobody is going to speak a lot about the work you did. They're going to speak about the person you were. And that's the thing that people remember. Love it. Something about Brits that few people know. That we our addiction to housing comes from the Middle Ages and feudalism. So every Brit dreamt of having their own small little home because an Englishman's home was his castle and very few people owned any land. So every American has a 401k. They watch perpetually. Every Brit dreams of paying off their mortgage and potentially having a rental property. Oh, interesting. Okay. A quote that you live by or think about often? Gosh, um, it's it's the Theodore Roosevelt one. It's a classic pioneer. He says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or whether doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort with that error or shortcoming. But he knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold, timid souls who have known neither victory nor defeat. Wow. That's probably the longest quote I've ever gotten in response to that question. <laughs> I think Sorry. it's actually, five, it might be maybe five times as long. Distill it for us in, in one sentence. What was the main point for you in that quote? <laughs> Forgive me. It's basically the sense of going, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail while daring greatly rather than be counted among those other cold, timid souls who never risked it all and have never known either great victory nor crushing defeat. I think we're going to have to put that on the internet under Steve Cochran. That we're going to have to do. That last one. <laughs> I think one. Theodore, Theodore might have a, at least he's been gone 75 years. Not the years first part, the, summer, the summarized version. Okay, the summarized version. there we go. Okay, well, the last thank one. You. Sure. A productivity tip that helps you to get more done, Steve. Um, we wrote an entire book on this called Five Gears, but learning to be present at the, in the right way at the right time with the right people. You can't get more time, but you can appear a lot more relationally intelligent if you choose how you're going to show up before you enter every social engagement. Mm. OK, so before we wrap up, let everybody know how they can reach out to you and to Jeremy, sure. learn more about your work and really benefit from the great the great things you guys are doing. Well, I, I guess kind of giantworldwide.com is the easiest website. There's plenty of, uh, and you can take a free communication code assessment to see how you're doing. Um, that's probably the easiest one. And just, you know, I, I love it when people reach out and if people go, hey, I've got a question, or can I grab 20 minutes on your calendar? Steve Cockrum on LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to kind of get hold of me. Um, so Steve Cockrum. Or if you want me to come speak anywhere, the stevecockram.com, which basically has um, all kinds of ways that you can go come and speak online, come and share, do what I do. So there's your three things, giantworldwide.com, Steve Cockram on LinkedIn, or stevecockram.com as a speaking site. Awesome. Okay. Well, you've shared a lot. I wish we could talk for longer, uh, but as they say, all good things must come to an end. But in the meantime... Wrap up our session, please, with one final life lesson, something that you've distilled over all of your years that you think would yeah. put, just put a nice touch to the end of our conversation. So for leaders, you have to know yourself to lead yourself. You cannot lead others before you know what it's like to be on the other side of you. That's very powerful. I think I'm going to ruminate over that one for a little bit. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned a lot and I thank you for spending some time with me today. Um, and, 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 and I, and I'm sure people will be reaching out to you because you have a lot to offer. So thank you very much and uh, continued success with all you do. Thank you, Natalie. And to you.
Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 